the city Philippines chapter organizes a free dental clinic for residents in Quezon City. We see how Taiwan's urban regeneration stations help better change and preserve historical districts. Welcome to Dar Headlines, I'm Wendy Chen, thank you for joining us. First up in Malaysia, strong winds and massive rainfall struck the residential area of Amman Padan in Klan on March 17th, leaving 27 houses damaged. Upon hearing the news, 60 city volunteers mobilized to assist with the clean-up and also prepared hot meals for the survivors. Here at the residential area of Amman Padan, 27 houses were damaged by strong winds and sudden rainfall. Residents are still recovering from the terrifying experience. Strong winds swept through in this direction. Rocks and falling tiles hit the windows and walls of my house. They were all damaged. Upon receiving the news, 60 volunteers arrived soon after to survey the needs of survivors and help residents clean up. When we arrived, we were shocked because we didn't expect to see such massive damage. Many roofs and walls were ruined or had even collapsed. Rainwater had flooded several homes as well. Our help was really needed. Later, volunteers prepared hot meals to warm stomachs and offer emotional support. We are really grateful for your help. A big thank you to the Siji brothers and sisters. This is the Malaysian spirit. 2014 has just begun and there have already been several disasters, drought, water shortages and a missing flight. Master Zhen Yan had her point in promoting the Million Bodhisattva campaign. We need to speed up our recruitment and get more people to join Siji so that the fields of blessings can expand and flourish. As natural disasters continue to take their toll, humankind is beginning to understand the importance of environmental protection. Moving to the Philippines to help those without the means to pay for dental treatment, the City Philippines chapter has been holding free dental clinics in Quezon City every month. Recently, one such clinic was held in Barangay Tadansora, benefiting a total of 97 residents. Here inside a local gym, the City Philippines chapter is preparing for another free dental clinic, this time at Barangay Tangang Sorai in Quezon City. To help those that cannot afford dental services, the City Philippines chapter has been holding free dental clinics on a monthly basis for the surrounding community. Although for many children this is their first time seeing a dentist, they still put on their bravest face. It was my first time seeing a dentist. I was very nervous at first, but after the dentist took my tooth out, I felt all right. It didn't hurt at all. Thank you all very much. Thanks to free clinic, Michelle Rivas, who has been suffering from a toothache for weeks, can finally put her problem to rest. Okay, okay. This free dental clinic is such a great help because I have been suffering from a toothache for a long time. The most important thing is that even if we want to see a dentist, we don't have the money to pay for the visit. Uh, Through City's mobile dental clinic, I can help those in need of dental care. This is something that I love to do and I will continue to do so. This is my goal. Following the clinic, doctors also thoughtfully provided patients with painkillers to reduce any pain after treatment. In just a date, a total of 97 people benefited from the clinic. Back to Malaysia, more than 10 days have gone by since flight MH370 went missing, and although the whereabouts of the aircraft has yet to be confirmed, city volunteers have remained supportive to family members in China and Malaysia. Next, we meet three city volunteers who have set aside their personal challenges to help family members through this difficult time. Providing comfort and support to a family member of passengers on board the missing Malaysia Airlines flight is Malaysia City volunteer Wang Cheng Yao. In February 1998, I was in Taiwan and heard a conversation between Taoyuan City volunteers and Master Zheng Yan regarding the China Airlines crash. 
I was very moved when I heard about the service volunteers provided for family members. Following the crash of China Airlines Flight 676 some 16 years ago, Wang Chenyao decided to join the volunteers' ranks. With the Malaysian jet still missing, Wang flew to Beijing to assist. This time, all of us were able to use the skills and experience we have gained through home visitations. We were able to soothe family members' anxious hearts. Also contributing her share in helping these family members through this difficult time is to the volunteer He Cui Ying, who decided to take days off from work to volunteer. I took a week off from work so I can come here and help. Knowing the pain and suffering family members are going through, this group of Blue and White Angels will continue to provide assistance whenever and wherever needed. I think this is a great opportunity for us to learn and grow. We can learn many things when we walk out of our comfort zone. Thinking of her son who has been missing for more than 10 days, this mother can no longer hold back her tears. By her side is Tzu volunteer Ling Mei Ling. I am a single parent myself. I know exactly the pain of losing a child. We feel very sad to see them crying. Other than raising two children on her own, Ling is also the owner of a health equipment company in Malaysia. Although a successful businesswoman, it did not bring her much joy until she met Tzu Through volunteering, we are also learning how to deal with impermanence. I have been carrying out Tzu's missions in Beijing for some 15 years. Master Zhenyan taught us that we need to put ourselves in others' shoes, so we can feel for their suffering just as if it were our own. Twenty years ago, Tzu volunteer Zhen Yunji moved from Taiwan to China and later established six kindergartens in Beijing. Other than striving for success, Zhen also sees the chance to volunteer. After taking Master Zhenyan's dharma to heart, we need to use this wisdom when carrying out Tzu's charity missions and helping those in greater need. Thanks to these experienced Tzu volunteers, many family members of those on board the missing jet have a place to express their worries and have regained the strength to face the trials ahead. As no conclusions have been made to the mystery surrounding the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 317, on March 18th, all family members of those on board decided to stop waiting for news at the airport hotel. Prior to the family's announcement of their departure, an evening acupuncture session was held by team of members to help everyone get a good night's rest. Worried about her son's whereabouts and suffering from exhaustion, the 70-some-year-old senior even has trouble speaking Mandarin. The senior is comforted by the doctor's friendliness. In order to help family members relax and get a good night's sleep, an evening acupuncture session was held. Many are light sleepers or suffer from anxiety. Acupuncture can release their stress and help them sleep better. This is the second traditional Chinese medicine services held by Tima at the hotel. And even crew members from Malaysia Airlines came to seek treatment. It's like uh, everybody was talking about it. So I actually came just to get to know what is it about and all that. So they say that to relieve your stress all that and so on, you can go through this acupuncture method. So I came to give it a try now. The evening acupuncture session helped relieve some of the stress family and crew members have been experiencing during this time. But since family members have decided to leave the Everly Hotel, city volunteers are packing up as well. In the 11 days the family members were there, a number of 400 volunteers offer comfort 24 hours a day. We're relieved to see family members doing a bit better. Although everyone is still grieving, it's good to see them feeling better. From the moment volunteers arrived at the hotel, they have been offering comfort to these distraught family members, besides aid supplies and prepaid SIM cards. A blessing ceremony was held to help ease spirits.
two sessions of traditional Chinese medicine services also helped nearly 100 patients. Upon hearing Tsuji volunteers mention the Mapu Coin Bank, some donated the consolation money received from Malaysia Airlines to help the less fortunate. Some took home bamboo coin banks, others donated money. Everyone here is trying to think of this in a positive way, even though we all met under such terrible conditions. Other volunteers are leaving the hotel. Their service to Malaysia Airlines continues. Other city volunteers are still at the airport's emergency operations center, taking calls in Chinese ensuring that those who need comfort are still able to receive it. Following Typhoon Mara caught in 2009, which wiped out the entire Shaolin village in Kaohsiung, the Taiwanese government asked the National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction and 20 other government agencies to work out a disaster warning system to monitor potential flooding or mudslide points around the island. In the wake of Typhoon Funapi in 2010, the warning system successfully prevented any tragic loss in Pingdong's Laiyi village. Let's take a look. We are here at Laiyi village in Pindong. As you can see, several houses were ruined by rock slides, and 30 houses were buried in mud. Satellite images show the power of natural disasters. This is the image before the disaster. After the typhoon struck, heavy rainfall carried massive rocks and soil downstream and buried the village. Fortunately, there were no casualties reported following the disaster as the residents of the village were all safely evacuated in advance. Actually, the residents were reluctant to evacuate in the beginning. Finally, the local officials got through to them, and the over 500 residents of Lai village finally agreed to move into the evacuation center. Thanks to the disaster warning mechanism, the villagers' lives were spared. However, residents of the Shaolin village were unable to escape a similar tragedy as the technology was not there to predict the need to evacuate. Before, we didn't have the technology to accurately predict mudslides and rock slides and issue warnings. However, now the government has developed a disaster alert system. When debris flows occur, they will break the wire and the system will transmit the information back to our bureau. It continuously projects radar waves. As the radar wave touches the water surface, it reflects back and we can detect changes in water levels. When debris flows occur, rocks will collide and generate noise, so we can use the geofoam to detect any ground vibration. The data collected from across the island will be transmitted back to the National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction where researchers will analyze the data and carry out disaster prevention and response measures accordingly. Currently, we have combined over 120 sorts of data from 20 government agencies, for example, satellite cloud images from the Central Weather Bureau, hydrological data from the Water Resources Agency, and debris flows warnings from the Soil and Water Conservation Bureau. No longer a passive actor in disaster prevention, the government now takes a front seat in disaster prevention and response work. With such a system, residents can be evacuated to a safe place in the face of future disasters, so that the number of casualties will greatly decrease. Members of the public are now also better informed. Before, they received disaster updates through radio and TV only. However, now they have learned to go online to receive real-time information. We go online to check the water levels and rainfall upstreams the river. The daily weather forecast is something not as accurate as the information online. In the wake of an increasing number of extreme weather situations, the Taiwanese government has learned to start focusing on disaster prevention so to better safeguard citizens' lives and properties. 
Also in Taiwan, in what has been called urban regeneration stations, community members, cultural and architectural experts, as well as government officials in Taipei, are coming together to preserve an area's cultural heritage while still introducing changes to improve standards of living and the general beauty of the area. Here's more. Xing'e District is one of Taipei's main urban hubs as well as its undisputed economic heart. Here, skyscrapers stretch into the sky and a well-defined transportation network brings tens of thousands of people here and back. During the 2014 New Year's Eve celebration held at Xing'e's 101, over 2.78 million arrived by public transport to welcome the new year. Looking back to the 1950s, the Xing'e district was a much different place. At that time, it was the location of an arsenal and a military dependence village. However, as time changed, so did the face of the area. Cities at a certain point all need renewal. When an area is too old, it needs to be developed. For development to occur, however, we first need comprehensive planning. Now Xingyi is home to corporate headquarters and some of Taipei's most upscale housing. Often compared to Manhattan, the Xingyi we know today was the result of careful planning and design. Residential buildings of 30 years or older make up over 70 percent of Taipei's urban landscape. Yet urban renewal is not the only option when looking for a facelift. It is no longer as simple as redeveloping rundown areas. The whole process now involves the complex issues of land rights. Some areas, for example Beitou, have a local character and offer a unique local culture. Why do we want to wipe that out? In order to preserve the unique history and culture of Taipei's various districts, a new movement has quietly been gaining steam in many of Taipei's more historical districts. In those areas, we have a chance to introduce an improvement to the overall environment. Every area needs a different strategy. This is the thinking nowadays. We are moving from urban renewal to urban regeneration. Urban regeneration use URS or urban regeneration stations as their center of operations. At URS, one finds like-minded people ranging from cultural workers or scholars, old-time residents or students eager to make a difference in their community. From their base, this core group leads the local community in looking at their environment and how they can improve it in a way that does not sacrifice its local flavor. Urban regeneration helps areas find a sense of vitality once again, while urban renewal is more about knocking down the old to build the new in its place. This movement, this regeneration is not limited to the transformation of the physical environment only. It also includes people's hearts and the collective hope that the community has for the area. Currently, there are seven urban renewal stations in Taipei, with four of them in the historical district of Dadaochen. We are using this method to slowly discover what these older areas need most in terms of improvement. Today, Taipei's renewal is more about the hopes and dreams of community residents who are eager to bring new life and vitality into their communities. Since its inception, URS has garnered much international attention, with Taiwan being invited to attend the annual international building exhibition held in Germany. The first non-European country ever invited, it seems as if Taipei's residents have come up with a winning formula. Each city volunteer that commits to join the initiative to watch Master Zinyan's Wisdom at Dawn broadcast has their own hurdles to overcome. From the City Malacca chapter in Malaysia, we meet two city volunteers who conquered a few challenges to join the study group. Making deliberate strokes to write Chinese characters, 47-year-old Hou Meizhen has difficulty even writing her own name. She is mildly mentally disabled, so although she went to school, she is still not able to write very well. A childhood fever affected Hou Meizhen's brain and slowed down her ability to learn ever since. However, her participation in watching Master Zhenyan's Wisdom at Dawn broadcast has actually improved her penmanship. 
Before, I didn't know how to write, but since I came here, I told myself that I needed to learn how to do so. She looks at each character and meticulously copies down the word. Now her penmanship is beautiful. During the process of copying down each word of wisdom, it seems as if Ho Meijun has taken the Dharma to heart as well, as her temperament has changed. In the past, if you made a comment to her, she would get really upset and escape upstairs to not come down until an hour or two later. But now she has really changed a lot. Meanwhile, for Chen Youjian, rising early to participate in the initiative is the difficult part. I would participate one day and sleep in the next three days. It was difficult to overcome the obstacles of waking up early because I'm so used to sleeping late. Encouraged and determined to change, Chen Youjian wakes up even earlier to make breakfast for the volunteers that come to the morning study session. If they eat breakfast here, when they get home, they can have a rest before doing household chores. In that way, they are like coming to watch the master's teachings because they can absorb the Dharma and get breakfast too. Sister Yeo Jun is very thoughtful. After watching the master's teachings and discussions, we can eat breakfast and head off to work on a full stomach. While thinking about others' needs, Chen Yeo Jun also cultivates her own wisdom. Staying in Malaysia's Malacca, we meet another city volunteer, Yang Duiten, who was diagnosed with a rare eye disease last year. Thankfully, with help from his counterparts in Japan, Yang made a full recovery and has also inspired his parents to join city's recycling efforts. I didn't think I would feel this way about Siji. Volunteers were like Guan Yin Bodhisattva reaching out to help us. Trying to hold his tears back as he speaks of Ji is recycling volunteer Yang Changhe, who once disagreed with his son's devotion to the charity organization. After his son was diagnosed with a rare eye disease last year, it was with the help of Japan City volunteers that Yang son received the treatment he needed. Grateful, Yang Changhe and his wife have since joined their son in Ji's environmental mission. When I took my son to Japan to receive treatment, the volunteers there would always show us the way or took us wherever we needed to go. Going there to Japan, I didn't feel like I was away from home because all the brothers and sisters there were just like those in Malacca, so I was able to receive my treatment without worries. Prior to receiving treatment, Yang Duiten wanted to give up, but it was the blessing from Master Zhenyan that gave him the strength to go on. The master said she has eye and heart problems as well, yet she has been able to still accomplish much. Whatever illness we are faced with, we should receive the necessary treatment. Today, Yang Duiten has not only fully recovered from his illness, but is walking the city path together with his family. Canada will join city volunteers who handed out 708 packs to needy residents in the cities of Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam and Port Moody to help them through the cold winter. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.